My name is John Passfield, and I'm going to read from my novel, Eleonora Duza, Let Me Have My Wings. The title of this reading will be Eleonora Duza, Video 16, Chapter 15, The Aftermath of a Relationship. So here is the cover of the novel, Eleonora Duza, Let Me Have My Wings, a novel by John Passfield and a photograph of the historical Eleonora Duza. Here's the summary of the novel. Eleonora Dusa spends her whole career producing, directing, and acting in, in the great female roles of the theatrical repertoire. She claims that when she's not on stage, she does not exist. A poet publishes a novel in which an aging actress's only role is to be a young poet's muse. The publication of the novel is a crisis for Ledusa as the fictional portrait of a pathetic, clinging female threatens to fill the void and become her personal myth in the mind of the public. But her greatest fear is that the imagery of the poet's book will alter the way she thinks of herself. Eleonora Dusa, the main character of this novel, has been sidetracked from her role as a great actress of a 19th century stage. She has taken on a lover who seemed to her, at first, to be capable of writing great roles for her to play. However, a few years later, the plays have proven to be inferior, and the lover has turned on her and savaged her reputation in the public mind. Will the searing pain of the breakdown of that relationship prove to be temporary, or will it fester as negative imagery in her mind as time moves on and undermine the life of great accomplishment that she was enjoying before she met the writer of that novel? In the aftermath of that potentially damaging relationship, she searches among her past and present life experiences for the supportive imagery that she hopes will help her to move forward on a positive path. There are 16 chapters of thought in the mind of the main character. Here are some of the images from the 15th chapter the second last chapter of thought in the novel and therefore in her mind. So we go to page uh, 119. Here we are. Lying dead on the stage, Marguerite or Cleopatra or Hedda. Lying here dead as the air sawing thespians emote, I am as dead as dead can be. And there is no one who can breathe life into this corpse but some other me. Some other me who is not my current person. Some other me who I used to be. Where's the Juliet? that I was on my 14th birthday. Come to me, Juliet, as I lie here and kiss myself awake. I wish to rise up and exit from this tomb. That's two uh, paragraphs. Let's go to the second uh, segment of two paragraphs. No more Denunzio plays. I've tried, I have tried, I've tried. I have beaten the dead horse with a huge stick. The dead horse will not rise and pull the load. Sarah knew. She knew as soon as she stepped on the stage. She was only in thrall for a moment, a brief moment in the spell of the silver tongue. And she saw the mediocrity behind the bright eyes. She rolled the dead horse into the ditch and carried on while well, that Sarah Bernhardt, her great rival. I believe I was born for Ibsen. I believe that Ibsen was made for me. If only Denunzio had risen to that level. A shallow poet with the brilliant sparkle of 
tawdry jewels. But Ibsen reached down into the mud and found the gem and held it up to the cleansing light. Ibsen, the man who understands the female heart. So that's the second segment. Here's the third segment. Taking plays all over the world, touring and touring and touring again, playing all the parts I've played and always searching for something new. Every part has something to say to me. I have something to say to each part. Sometimes I caress the lady I play, and sometimes she caresses me. Sometimes I seize her by the throat, and sometimes it is she who seizes me. I'm refreshed, and I'm exhausted. I breathe, and I choke when I am on stage. I stagger into my dressing room, and I sigh and flop down on my chair. I live my life over and over. I crawl over inches. I fly over miles. I am all who have lived, and all who are certain to die. There is not one person with whom I do not share. Let's go on to the uh, fourth section of thought in this novel, leaving out many other images. Or in this chapter, of course, leaving out many other images. Why, I wonder, did I not shed a tear for Sarah? He spoke of the aging muse as he sharpened a nib of his pen. I felt it was Sarah to the T. If the Nunzio chose to be cruel to Sarah, what was that, I thought, to me? Only he knew what had passed between them, and that was that. She had been cruel to me in action, as I had been cruel to her in thought. What his novel would say about Sarah was nothing to me. Well, we sow, and then we gather. We toil in similar fields. There is a harvest for every sower in every year. Judge Brack comes to see me. He feels quite welcome in my home. He speaks of a party that he monitored last night, of a person who had no vine leaves in his hair. He speaks to me of his future plans. He speaks of the things that people will say, of doors that will open that will now be closed, that he will be a constant presence in my life. If I were playing his part, I believe I would twirl my mustache. Now we go to the fifth segment of thought in her mind in this chapter. Vienna, Moscow, St. Petersburg, moving deeper into Ibsen, acting in a doll's house, Hedda Gabler, Rosmersholm, bathing in the waters of the Ibsen plays, feeling the need for something more than the tried and the true. Most of the plays that hold their stage are from the old era. They are Sarah's cup of tea. Broad gestures, elaborate costumes, shallow poetry, chanted or bayed. With Hedda and Nora, I can feel myself come alive. I wonder how old Ibsen is. I would love a tour in Norway. I can see his soul in his writing. How wonderful it would be to meet the man. And then we go to the sixth uh, segment of thought in this chapter. New York, Paris, London, moving deeper into Shakespeare. Shakespeare, I thrive in the parts of Shakespeare. His female characters speak to me, but his imitators have the depth of a puddle, and the popular drama can no more stir my soul. Shakespeare alone in his boarding house, on his horse, or in a carriage, on his way to or from his home. What is he thinking? What is he experiencing? What does he know? Whatever it is, is as deep down inside him, waiting for him to dredge it up, waiting for him to find the words that will make it soar and make it sing. I see him sitting in the candlelight after spending a difficult day. He pulls some paper out of his pocket and writes some words. There's no exit from the stage. Judge Brack has blocked every exit that I can see. Now, 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 now. What exit do I not see? 
I stand in silence as he talks. He talks of valuable notebooks, of superfluous persons, of mutual understandings, while I think. And then the seventh segment of thought in this chapter, moving deeper into myself. What do these playwrights have that I do not have? What do these playwrights have that I need? What do these playwrights have that I am working my way towards? Each has stood alone on a precipice, wondering whether to step or jump out into the air. I stand alone on a precipice of my own. And then the eighth and final segment of thought in this chapter of thought, Yes, my daughter yearns for my visits. Yes, the playwrights send me their plays. Yes, the reviewers sharpen their pencils. Yes, the public place their pennies on the box office counter. But I am me, alone on the stage with all the emotions that I feel, with all the thoughts that I have in my head, with all the words of all the women who have lived before me. And I am the one who now is standing on that precipice. I am the one who is deciding whether to take that step, whether to step or jump or soar out into the air. And then her final thought in this chapter of thought, the second last chapter of thought in the novel, I shall have to shoot Judge Brack or... I shall have to shoot myself. It seems to me at the moment that there is no other choice. Who are you to judge me, you who hold me in your hand? Yes, yes, I see it clearly now. A moment of perfect clarity is mine. Yes, I have my father's pistol. I see now that I shall have to shoot Judge Brack. Uh, here's a note that I'd like to read. It strikes me that many poets of our time have the urge to write a novel. Poetry has been, for at least a hundred years, confined as a form to short items. And I suspect there is a sense among poets that there is more to be said, much more than can be expressed in a poem of just a few pages. But there's also a sense that poetry and the novel are two completely distinct genres. One uses imagery as its language and the other uses prose. We are now living in an era of two strict literary forms, the poetic form and the prose novel. And most people accept the forms of the era into which they've been born. So it's quite logical that writers today write in one of these forms. However, Forms change from era to era. The great eras of literature have often been the eras in which a new literary form has been needed. And in response, a new literary form has been created. While the lesser eras have been those in which writers of those eras have worked comfortably and competently within inherited forms, adding little to what those forms have already been shown to be able to to do. We in the early 21st century are as alive as the people of any other era in the history of humankind. We have much to say in our literature and much to explore. We should look to the writers who feel the need and answer the call to develop new forms. The prose novel as a form is so slick as to be over-familiar. I feel I have read each novel before I turn the first page. The lyric poem is very limited in what it can do. The poetic novel form, a form which combines the two languages of imagery and of prose, appeals to me as a literary device in which to explore the complexity of the 21st century myriad of human concerns. So the novel is, once again, Eleanor Duza, Let Me Have My Wings, a novel by John Passfield. Uh, it's found on Amazon. There's information there. 
It's found on my publisher's website, rocksmillspress.com, R-O-C-K-S-M-I-L-L-S-P-R-A-S-S.com. More information there. And on my website, johnpassfield.ca, J-O-H-N-P-A-S-S-F-I-E-L-D.ca, there's uh, two books uh, for free access. A planning notebook in which I work my way through the writing of the novel, a journal in which I review the novel as I'm uh, polishing the rough draft. So have a look there at johnpassville.ca if you're interested. Lastly, I'll just say thank you for watching this video.